Hello and welcome to the studio. I'm Peter Stjanovic and this roundtable is why is having a cloud data and edge strategy so complex? Andre, I'm going to come to you first with the first question. When we think about the right mix of destination choices for your applications of the cloud, as well as everything else, what are your decisions? Where do you go to first and how do you sort that? Well, um, when, I, when I started at Cancer Research UK about three years ago, we had an eclectic mix of a bit of everything. We had a bit of things on premise, mostly referred to as legacy. We had a bit in Azure, a bit in AWS, and there were no clear reasons why certain things were in certain places. So, um, so the, the, the challenge was to, to define some sort of a strategy to, to decide what should go where. And um, it's very difficult to go from, from something that makes no sense to something that is more um, organized. And um, you need to think about uh, where do your uh, skills lie? And as it happens, the, 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 the bulk of the skills for, for building custom things, uh, software engineering, was mostly on AWS rather than Azure. So the right answer for us was uh, was to, to, to invest on that and focus on that and shift over time onto AWS. And we decided to, to um, adopt and make the best of it rather than try to insulate and kind of abstract away from it. Um, so we, we decided to, to, to go native and, and uh, use AWS for um, everything custom that we build. We decided that we didn't want to invest in hosting off-the-shelf applications ourselves. So we, uh, so the strategy is now to, to, to if we buy something off the shelf, then um, try to go with a SaaS uh, vendor as much as possible. Um, of course, it's a long journey, and, and the, one of the, the, the challenges that's, uh, that we, we faced was as soon as we announced what the strategy was, the people that didn't didn't agree with it started thinking about, oh, uh, is this the right place for me? Shall I shall I look for a different job? And obviously, you, you when some of the people leave, then you're left with tech that you can't actually manage. So so that's 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 one of the the things you need to plan for and uh, and work your way through. Um, so I, th I would say that's why it's complex <laughs> because you have to you have to take people along uh, and the, the people that don't want to come along. You need to plan around that. Uh, Maritza, would you agree with the positions Andre's taken or have you taken a different approach? I would absolutely agree with that and I really like that approach of finding the straight line between two points because we've got so much complexity that we're dealing with in our IT environments and our IT landscapes and I love that approach of looking at what skills do we already have and what platform and technologies will align with that. I think that's a great approach. Um, you know, the decision on, you know, what should be moved where and what data should live where is a really complex one. And, and I want to add to what Andre said, because I think another consideration, actually two considerations, the, the one is legislation. And, you know, there's certain data that you can't have in the cloud or have in certain countries. You, you have to have that in country. So that would be another consideration. And Andre touched on the people component of it, but I think it's such an important component. And it's a consideration that we don't always look at when we make these decisions. But I think the use case is really, really important because you have to solve a real problem or open up a real opportunity for your organization. And that's far easier then to take the organization and the people in that organization with you because, you know, some BUs might not be ready to move to the cloud or to use the cloud, whereas others might be. So I think find the business stakeholders that's really going to support you in your cloud journey because the people component is probably, like Andre said, the most complex part of a cloud migration. So we've heard then, thank you, Maritza, you know, the people components and regulation elements additionally to Andre's position on, on that complexity about you know, choosing the right mix of, of destinations. Does anyone else on the, on the discussion have anything to add to that? Okay, so um, you know, HPE, we, we believe the future is going to be a hybrid element. Um, in a sense, the pendulum has now swung back. What 10 years ago was cloud first for absolutely everything, regardless of the question, has, has now come back to a realization that there are workloads that are more at home um, as a local essence or uh, on-prem. And I think people are now beginning to realize 
that there are business drivers which are more important than slide decks. And Andre actually made me smile because I agree with everything with a lot of what you've said. You know, you have those drivers where um, there are um, a regulatory pressure which might enforce a business decision. And you might have a technology advantage that can, that again, drive a business decision. But ultimately, it, it goes down to the business. And it's an element of reskilling or it's an element of um, finding those advantages that you can have from the business goals. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, some workloads are going to stay on-prem. Some workloads are going to stay in the cloud. And the successful businesses will be the ones that make the two of those work together um, under a common plane. Interesting. Okay. KK, Krishnamurthy, additional yeah, points from your right. sides? I think the first thing you have to think about is where is that data generated and where is it actually going to be used? So in certain places, uh, when we were on Azure, uh, the data was generated in Azure and therefore it made more sense to just keep it there. Something that people don't talk about is there are egress costs. If you decide to work on AWS, for instance, Azure will charge you every time you send that data out of Azure. And so you have to think about it. If you can actually stay in the cloud or in the place where it's generated and use it in that same place and you have all the tools there and the skills, why not use it right there? Um, the regulatory one <laughs> is interesting in a past life. Uh, uh, we were on uh, we were on Google, and we went to China, and we just couldn't do anything. So we had to immediately start transitioning to Azure, and then you have to pay the egress costs, right? Last week I was in India, and I was trying to access my. Uh, I work in the space of football. I'm at One Football, and I was trying to access my VPN, and it was almost impossible to get it done in any of the hotels there because VPNs are no longer allowed. And so what happens is the regulatory thing really changes how you look at this. And you have to think about it when you are beginning that transition, when you're beginning to think about it, where am I going to go in the future? Don't take decisions where you're going to have to close the door on them at some point and you can't close the door on them. And so really think through where is it generated? Where am I going to use it? Where am I actually going to be able to use it because of the worldwide regulations? And then of course, as Andre said, do I have the skills or can I acquire those skills if I don't have them? That's my thought. Yeah. So uh, from my side, what I can say is like when we talk about a cloud and the regulators, first and foremost, we need to understand what is the data we are talking about. First and foremost is to have a classification of data to understand whether it can be moved into cloud or not. Because generally what happens is we give a blanket statement saying that no, because we are into BFSI or financial domain, the cloud is not a best way to go about it. So first and foremost is do we have a data classification? Second, when we talk about in terms of a hyperscale environment, now earlier we used to talk about a hyperconvention, now we're talking about a hyperscale. Similarly, now the, when we talk about a cloud, we used to talk about a cloud, now then we started talking about a fog, and then we talked about in terms of edge. So I completely agree with Shitesh when he said like, you know, we need to understand what is the data, where it is getting generated, what is the life cycle of the data, what is the outcome the data would be giving to us, and last but not least is how the data are going to be get preserved. For an example, today, if I talk about uh, IO data or that OT data, OT data needs to be treated different way than the you know, IT data. Like in IT data, you might be having regulatory uh, binding wherein you need to keep the data for a couple of years. So do you really need to keep it on the cloud? Because, you know, five years, 10 years, probably people might say that, okay, I can go ahead and have it in a glacier or deep storage, whatever. But end of the day, it's a cost. So can we just bring back the data into our environment and store it in a secure way? That's number one. Number two is when we talk about in terms of multi-tenant sort of scenario. Today, like, you know, the cloud has become a necessary element for everything because we are talking about so many SaaS applications. We talk about API integration. We talk about, you know, uh, serverless computing. So all these are not future, but this is the present. On top of it, we are also talking about cybersecurity. Like, how are we going to manage? Because it is easy for you to manage something which is there in your premises. But how are you going to manage something which, for which you are not controlling it? So what is the paradigm or how you are going to control those elements and how valuable the data is? 
is something which one needs to understand before they can put across a strategy of cloud. People talk about cloud to be efficient and cost effectiveness. But if you do not maintain in a proper way, believe me, the same cloud is going to bring down the whole organization because the cost would be too high. Because you might have a different uh, touch points in terms of costing, be it, uh, you know, the storage cost, ingress cost, or maybe access cost, even though you shut down the instance, but still you would be paying a cost. So there's a lot of underlying agenda one needs to understand. And today's world, what is happening is someone will come and say, listen, I'm very good at the AWS. And, you know, in Google, it works in a different way. But as a business, we need to understand the ROI from where it is coming in. Then we need to put those things as a strategy to move forward. That would be my view. I think it's, it's raised a very valid point there in that you've got financials to juggle as well as the technical. And that one of the, the biggest secrets in the IT industry, whether you're looking at people that are at the coalface, is that they're doing the best with what they can with the skill set they have. And the truth is, when with a lot of migrations to the cloud, you find a lot of server administrators, a lot of Windows administrators, a lot of VMware administrators, just retrain as cloud administrators. And they're doing the best with the skill set they have. As you said, you know, you have colleagues when you've moved to AWS that um, some of the Azure team will either retrain or move on. And a lot of them, uh, I'm not going to say don't care about the financials, that's the wrong term, but a, a lot of them, it's not their, it's, it's not their priority to, to look at the financials. And we've all seen the jokes about, you know, how have you ended up homeless? Oh, I left an EC2 instance on and it, and it ended up sort of uh, taking everything through. There are those different skill sets. A lot of the people out there that have done that transition are, are just managing it as if it was local except they have a different UI in front of them. And, and that's how they work with. And really, I think the goal for a, a lot of us is to try, as technology leaders, is, is to educate them on how to bring those different elements together. Yeah, certainly what um, one of the primary drivers for when we established the strategy was what skills have we got and how do we make, make the best of them? Um, and we still use Azure quite a lot. We use uh, Office 365, Power Apps, all these things it was just about our where do we focus our custom development efforts cu uh, custom engineering efforts and uh, the balance of skills was was on on aws but um yeah so we we had to take people on that journey from being a linux administrator running servers on premise to actually now coding all the infrastructure using uh, infrastructure as code and, and the helping software engineers to, to to build their applications using serverless services on aws which is very different but fortunately, most of the people were actually excited to, to do something. What's um, a bit like most of these tech discussions, when we, when we think about anything regarding, you know, whether it's destination of choices versus innovation or strategy for transformation, it comes down to the people element of it, right? So that's one of those interesting things that we can all agree on, because one of the things that probably come across from these answers is it's incredibly personal. Mm. And sector or geography specific as to what are the, the remits and what are the facts involved in making these decisions. But presumably, you know, you've got workloads, apps, data, you know, all over the place, and you probably have those in set positions. Um, where should they live in an idealized world with, with everything set? Let's start with that position. Where, where should they? Where, where, uh, Nigel, why don't you go first? And where should they live in your view, perhaps quickly? There's no right answer. And, and, and that's going to be controversial, but um, they should live as close to each other as possible. Um, whenever workloads or whenever, whenever applications and data uh, have a relationship, whenever they are linked, they should be as close together as possible. There should be as few hops together as possible to be as efficient as possible. Again, I go back to the business drivers. If the business drivers is for that to be as quick as possible, um, I was talking to a customer yesterday that was about financial trading. They, they wouldn't even put a hypervisor in the middle because they viewed that as a delay. But then there are others where um, economy is the driver and they don't mind as long as simplification is the key. Uh, you really need to look to the, to the business priorities. Um, in, in ideal worlds, yes, you want everything uh, to operate according to one technological mantra, whether that be, um, in our case, hybrid, or in other case, cloud, or in other case, everything local. But in, in reality, it all boils down to the priority of the business mm -hmm. uh, and, and what they want, whether it's a combination of skill sets, it's a combination of priorities. But in, in, uh, to, to go back to it, you want, at the bare minimum, you want the, work, the application and the data that uses that as close as possible just to be as quick and as efficient as possible. 
Yeah, I'd like to add something to that. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and the the other business driver that I want to add is is risk. And we've we've talked quite a bit about risk and you you know the um, the protection of your data and certain types of data maybe shouldn't live in the cloud. It should be in country, on premise, etc. But the other consideration, risk consideration, I think that you have to think about is the the level of disruption to your business. You know, certain applications that are absolutely key applications, like maybe, for example, your um, custom application system. You know, if if that's down for a certain number of hours, that, that has a material impact on your business, on your bottom line. So that's a very important consideration is, you know, you don't want to disrupt your business. So I think, you know, you also need to classify your applications in terms of risk. Just like Krishna said, you have to classify your data. But I think before you start on your cloud journey, you've got to do a proper data driven exercise around your entire IT estate, classify each of your applications in terms of the risk, the level of disruption, as well as the ease of a migration. So you want to get to that really sweet spot where you want to start with the applications that's easy to migrate. So high technical feasibility, high business value, low business risk. Yeah, absolutely correct. And just to add on to it, also another aspect on the same line is like we also need to look into in terms of availability along with accessibility and the impact to the business. For an example, if I talk about, um, you know, we can put one of the best solution, but the solution can be uh, based on the business requirement. For an example, if I'm implementing an IOT based solution where the impact or the decision has to be in split second of, uh, you know, scenario then maybe I need to move the application closer to the where the data is getting originated. In certain scenario, what happens is you are just storing the data and based on that, you are going to do certain activity, be it a ERP, be it HRMS or something in which still you can go ahead and have some lag. So what uh, end of the day, what matters is when you are defining that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, the bottom line, you need to understand how soon you need to get that particular information out of the data. What would be the impact if the data information is not available on the real time? And third, last but not least is like, you know, when you talk about automation, like we talked about, uh, you know, digital manufacturing, so and so and so forth. So those things has to be in an autonomous way. Only exception should be coming forward for taking an action because if all the data are coming and uh, residing at single place and then we start analyzing it, it is like, you know, we are going to do a reactive impact of that, uh, whatever is happened. So we need to change that reactive approach to proactive based on the activity, what we are doing. For an example, if I talk about the telemedicine or we are talking about robotic operation, where split second of decision matters a lot, then we need to take it in a different way. But in the same time, like if you're talking about something where I can still, you know, sleep on the data and I can give the result, even if it's a two hour delay is fine with me, then we need to follow a certain different process altogether. And, and to, to jump on that, he actually talks about manufacturing and design very, very much so. And the, the number of times I've seen, you know, we, we take into account on local systems, um, you know, on-prem systems, uh, the concept of failover is a given. It's a, it's a regular conversation. And for cloud-based systems, uh, it's not always the case. And I'm seeing it more and more. But say, for example, if I proposed a, a large global um, uh, cloud control system or manufacturing systems all over the world, say SCADA or something similar, it would have amazing applications. It would be uh, give me amazing analytics that, will, uh, that would improve efficiency. It would bring lots and lots of benefits to the business. But if I didn't put a fail safe in there that meant that if there was no connectivity that the factory wouldn't continue operating, then that's a, it's a massive economic cost. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the point that was made about design is critical. So when you're doing cloud elements on there to, to enable you to have control and enable you to bring massive value to the business, you also need to have that element of the, if that cloud element is not there. 
so that local operation can continue. Yeah. Um, Cake, I'm going to come to you next just to move the conversation on a little bit, but I'm going to draw upon Maritza's point about basically t doing a whole company wide audit <laughs> to understand exactly where things are, what things are doing, and why they do it. And that's an important point because. So many of your peers, your, as technology leaders, your peers will have a vested interest as stakeholders in these decisions that you make um, and will have a daily access to them and will also need to buy into it, really. So with that in mind, that audit in mind, KK, I mean, how, how, how does one approach that audit of all of those workloads and apps? And, and then as a secondary question, you know, how, how do you get you know, people to buy in, your peers your, on the exec team or or um, alongside the rest of the business? I'll actually be uh, a devil's advocate and, and take the opposite tack to what we've been hearing. I'd actually say you don't actually start with an audit of the whole thing. Instead, what you do is you look at what are the biggest business priorities and you start with them. If, if, if I, I'll give you an example. I was the chief data officer at Farfetch and I used to lead data before that at Zalando. Uh, for us, as a retailer, the most important single day of the year is Black Friday, or if you look at the Cyber Week, right? Once you consider that a retailer can do you know, a, a month's worth of business in one day, it becomes really, really important that you don't mess up on that day. Now, <laughs> when you start with that premise that we have to make sure that Black Friday works, and you're going to get 100 times the traffic that you're expecting on any normal day on Black Friday, that simplifies your decisions quite a bit already because you know you must be in the cloud on that day. You know you must have auto scaling, but you must also be able to pre-reserve instances so that regardless of what happens, you can at least get to 80, 90% of capacity at that point, right? Once those decisions are taken for that first biggest business problem, the rest of it becomes a lot easier. There's only a few, a handful of vendors who can do those things that you need at that point. And then you start going down the list of priorities on what the next things are that you must solve for. Right now, in our case, now I'm at One Football. I'm the chief day uh, officer at One Football for the last five months. And guess what's going to be the most interesting day for us this year? It's going to be the FIFA World Cup, right? When the whole world, there'll be people who don't actually watch football. They're going to be there. They're going to be watching and they're going to be following and looking at scores, et cetera. How do we make sure that everything, including the app, the web, the connected TV experience, all of them actually work that day and in the build up to it and that it's ready now because FIFA is just six weeks away. So once you take that prioritization of the business problems, it becomes a lot easier to say, which technical problems do I need to solve? And then, of course, you have to, um, I'll give you a completely different example, which is very different. So in a certain um, one of the CDO lives that I had in the past, we were doing uh, a lot of machine learning with uh, GPUs. And these GPUs are frightfully expensive if you do that on the cloud. However, if there's something that you really, really need to do really quickly, um, you want to use the latest generation of GPUs. How we figured out how we can save some money on it was as soon as that generation became older, we would go buy a bunch of them and put them in our in-house uh, uh, data center so that you're not paying through your nose for the most advanced processor. So it's a combination of figuring out business priorities, understanding how you can do a lot of these with lower cost, and then, of course, what Andre said earlier about skills. If you don't have those skills, can I actually get those skills? And if I can get those skills, then let's plan ahead of it. And then over a period of time, you will get to the full audit of the company. I would just not start with the audit. I would start with the most uh, difficult business problem or the most important, sorry, business problem to solve. Sometimes, for instance, it may not even be real time, right? Krishna talked about real time you know, really real time versus sort of real time. In the case of a you know goal happening uh, in in FIFA, you probably want to be really real time because you don't want to hear about it you know five seconds later than anybody else who heard about it. Somebody might be you know really upset if they if they heard that uh, after somebody else had already heard about it. So there are things you have to prioritize, and then based on that, you decide where the apps go and which cloud you use.
I would like to add something to what KK said. I, I, I agree. I think it's a really good approach to, to start with a use case that's going to really bring value to the business. And the other reason I think it's a good approach is that the, the governance process that you're going to have to complete first before you can move that first application um, to the cloud could take months. It, it could take nine months. And if, you, if your scope is too big, then it just complicates that governance process. And I'm speaking from someone who's in a, who works in banking. So we've got mm -hmm. lots and lots of um, governance. Um, but if your use case is very focused, it, it's a smaller use case, your scope is quite focused, then it's probably easier to get through that governance process because you can very easily um, describe the purpose of that uh, um, project as well as the type of data that you're going to move to the cloud. And I think that is key when you go through a governance process. So, so KK, 100% on the same page as you. And I think, Maritza, you hit on something really important. You can actually make a hero or heroine out of the people who helped you lead that project. So you asked a question earlier about how do you make sure you get that buy-in? You find a couple of people like what Maritza just said, you know, hey, let's get these people and let them be really successful together with us as a partnership, not as a client server, but as a partnership. Yeah. They become heroes. They'll talk to 10 other people. You put them on the company wide platforms and you get more and more buy in when people see that this actually works. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more with that. You know, any IT initiative especially something like cloud that could be very new to your organization has to be IT enabled, but business led. Yes, I, would, uh, I, I can completely relate to that, uh, KK. I, I, so we followed a similar approach where what was the most critical problem that we had to solve? Uh, we have something called stand up to cancer that happens on channel four. Uh, it's a, it's a, sequence of, of TV shows where uh, lots of people raise money for, for, for cancer. And uh, that's the equivalent of Black Friday for us. Um, and we really had problems with, with scaling our uh, online donation journey to, to, to cope with that specific event that happened every year. So we started there and that's where we adopted, started adopting a serverless approach to, to building our custom um, external facing journeys. So, um, and, and it worked really well, we expanded from there. And now we have lots of other product teams adopting the same, the same approach and, and have migrated to a similar architecture. So yeah, start with what is the business challenge that is the highest priority and it's usually a good, a good place to start. Yeah, usually the most public facing one. So we've, had, we've got prioritization, we've got a, an auditing of that too. I love KK, your position of, of people buy-ins, I think you're absolutely right. Those internal stakeholders are so key of driving change internally and that's where most of these um, efficiencies begin. And then when we think about you know, the strategies that you've used to therefore maximize some of these cloud benefits, we normally um, fall naturally on cost, don't we? But it, it's also efficiencies, it's efficability, it's those people buy-in. So, that's a nice point, and it sort of leads us quite nicely onto one of the final points, which is, you know, how, how are you? How are you driving some of those um, benefits and maximise the benefits that either has been promised to you or you've promised to, to the rest of the organisation? Um, Krishna Murthy, I'll come to you first, if I may. When we think about those benefits realised and maximised, where do you start? Where have you started? So what happens is like, you know, in terms of uh, getting the maximum benefits, the best way to do is, is to uh, break into a different subsect, maybe in an agile mode and take each part as a project and execute it, see that particular output and then retweak rather than taking the entire chunk and, you know, move forward to execute a lot of time what has been said or seen, like as KK said, unless until you have a buy-in from the business or business user agrees to the solution, whatever solutions has been implemented by IT may not get adapted very easily. So one needs to see the output. One needs to see how what is the benefit it is bringing to the table. And based on it, the next step can be taken. Because initially, like, you know, we have also seen in the past, business always has a reservation for the new ideas or the innovation. 
But once they start seeing the results, then they themselves will come back and say, listen, you have done something like this. So can we look into an other option where I have a challenge and we can, you know, articulate it in a better way? Because most of the time, what we have seen specifically in my scenario, business, they themselves don't know what problem it is. But because they are not in a position to articulate, so everything comes up as a, a you know, a bottleneck, as a roadblocker. But once we start giving them a small, small piecemeal sort of solutions with a, you know, defined output, then the buy-in goes up. And also we, in that process, we know exactly how to curtail a cost, if at all, if we have to, or what are the other aspects which we have missed out can be incorporated for a greater success. So that is what precisely my and what we are adapting in our scenario. I mean, I, I would say personally, when you look to show the benefit, you have to step away from the technology. You, you have to, uh, the, the benefit changes depending on who you are talking to. As technologists, we are often guilty of getting lost in the technology itself. If I am speaking to somebody that only cares about the financials and only cares about um, the end result, then uh, in, in reality, you, you have to be able to change your language onto the impact. What is the business outcome? Um, I'm picking on you, Andre, just because you're sat at the table with me, you know, on the stand-up to cancer piece. Uh, if, if, I, if, if whatever I'm putting in doesn't solve the problem, then it, it, it's, it's just a project in, in, in development. It's just fun. And I think you have to go all the way up the stack from the individuals that want to see an outcome um, on a particular metric down to the individuals that are going to be responsible for implementing it uh, from a customer side, from us as a vendor side. And the more honest that you are, and the more honest that you are in, in showing the ability to solve these problems, then you can really maximize those benefits and expose them for what, you know, for what they are and how good they are and the, and the, the value they can show to the business. Whether it be we tell a story of um, freeing up individuals, but I think we need to separate the the benefit from the technology that delivers that benefit because in reality you know we have seen um, massive benefits in migrating uh, technologies to a cloud-based technology but likewise i have worked with a vendor that has the equivalent of a black friday um, over the month of december and there was a big push to put that into the cloud but it stayed it stayed um, uh, on, on premise for that because all the work to do it on one side would have been countered um, in, in doing other work to mitigate on the other. And I think if we learn that depending on who we speak to that, and recognizing the benefits are different to each of those teams, then we can really maximize the message of the impact that we want to give. Sounds like you've done that from experience. <laughs> <laughs> Andre, your perspective, you know, cloud realization of those maximum benefits, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I agree with Nigel. The, the, the benefits actually come from what uh, what are the, the the outcomes that the the organisation is trying to achieve. So for us, at the moment, we've got strategic outcomes around how we engage with our audiences, with our supporters, our volunteers, for example. That's one strategic pillar. Another one is around sustainability. How can we get better at delivering our mission uh, while spending as little as possible or our internal costs so that we can we can maximize the spend uh, on on core purpose so you're measuring that against so, internal purpose-driven metrics exactly. almost qualitative and quantitative exactly so it's it's our strategic pillars that we're trying to achieve as an organization and actually anything to do with cloud is only to, to serve these strategic objectives it's not it's not a thing in, in, in its own right mm -hmm. if it serves sustainability because we have more efficient processes and, and we can achieve the same thing um, uh, at a lower cost then that's that's great and, and that's the angle yeah that's a nice point actually andre maritza from your side any we've just heard about some of the internal uh, pillars that one can mark against a certain solution or service like cloud is that the same for you uh, in the finance sector yeah, so um, agree. These these the business KPIs um, that we've talked about. You know, choosing the right um, uh, use case, etc. But then there's also the the more technical operational KPIs that you want to add to that because you 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 want that end to end view. Um, the one thing that I want to add is um, partnership and how important it is to choose the right partners because 
th this is quite a big complex project even if you're just doing a poc it's going to be quite complex and you want it to be a success you want to show that benefit and you want to give it the best chance to show the business value so I would say you have to partner with the right people in business, like AK said. You have to partner with the right vendor. You have to partner with the right implementation partner. And you have to partner with the right people in IT. It's going to take all of those different players to make this a success. So it's definitely a team sport. So for me, it's about the partnership and making sure you've got all the right people involved. I was just going to say that I think what everybody is saying is data is a people problem and cloud data is a people problem as well it takes a village to get anything done unless you're a really really small company and i think that's the critical part of it figure out who those partners are going to be who's going to benefit from it what's that storytelling that we can that we can uh, uh, define right if you can get that story right and figure out what that storytelling is going to be about uh, then half your job is done. I'll give you an example. As if, with a company like ours, media company in the sports space, um, subscriber churn, right, is really important. When did people come and, and watch something? When did they interact with our content? When did they go away? What do we learn from that, right? What's happening outside in this uh, environment? If you think about that, who is churn going to be important to? Churn's going to be important to the finance people, to the business people, to the marketing people. Basically, everybody across the company who is doing anything in the space of business wants to know when customers are coming, when customers are leaving. So once you figure out what is that critical thing that people need to know, and let me step one step further behind this. Um, it's not churn, it's customers. So if you learn enough about those customers, you can go to each one of these businesses and say, hey, what's your customer problem? What do you really want to learn from them? Somebody will want churn, somebody will want customer lifetime value. And then you can look at what are the technologies I could use today in order to solve that problem. So it starts out as a people problem. Data, cloud, technology today now really is a people problem. Mm. And uh, thank you, Keiki, for that, that sort of closing remark. We have a couple of minutes left. Andre, we start with you, so I'll close with you. It's sort of a final question. We, we have learnt in this roundtable about the complexities that these positions take, that these solutions offer. And in many ways, we've understood why that's the case, from prioritisation to audit, to the team element, to buy-in, to the range of uh, offers out there. But Andre, do, do you think that complexity is justified? Absolutely. We, um, I think we, 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 wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we were not um, working on how best to, to use uh, cloud to, to achieve our organization's objectives. So that's why, that's why all of us are here to, to work through this complexity. So, Fantastic. Yes. Well, Andrew, thank you for that last point. And thank you all for joining us on this roundtable today. Uh, this has been the studio. And thank you for joining us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.